All right. Multi-factor authentication and two-factor auth are becoming quite popular, and a lot of companies do that these days and use that to secure their environments and applications. But how do we actually, how does it actually work and how do we use them? And that's what Christopher Svensson, who's a principal engineer at Twilio, is going to talk to us about. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Again, the talk is multi-factor authentication, uh, how it works and why you need to be using it yesterday. Um, especially with all the security breaches in the news, I think this is a particularly timely talk. And I think there's even one or two other talks at this conference about it. Um, so what exactly am I going to be talking about? Uh, Multi-factor authentication and applications to Django, because this is a DjangoCon. Um, who's, the who's the talk for? I think there's something in it for just about everybody. I do go into some of the little mathier details and some of the Django details, and there's a little bit of code. But there's also a lot of high-level stuff. So I think pretty much anyone who wants to know more about MFA can get something. Uh, the talk is available on GitHub. Um, it's just Swenson is my last name, and you can just find it in my recent repos. Um, and I have my Twitter handle there at the bottom of every slide, uh, if you can sort of see that on one of them. Um, okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm Christopher Swenson. Again, I work at Twilio um, as a software engineer. I previously worked at companies like Google and Simple and also the U.S. government. Um, I'm from Portland, Oregon in the States. Uh, occasionally, I work on Beware, which is a Python project. Uh, and I have organized PyDX in the past, which is a Python conference in Portland, Oregon. Um, I, I'm just a curious person in general about all this stuff, so that's why I give talks like these. Um, and I wrote a book on cryptography once, so I can speak with a little bit of authority on cryptography things, uh, and I'm always curious about cryptography, which is why I, I talk about that here. Um, yeah, so uh, the motivation really was that I saw you know, these multi-factor multi authentications, and I wanted to know, I already said all this basically out loud, um, how it all works. Uh, and so I'm going to go through briefly some history. Uh, this, I guess, is more for uh, just reference and anything like that. Authentication, how the SMS stuff works, bias, a little bit about biometrics, uh, some of the problems, some of the cryptography, uh, and then some of the newer stuff coming out. And as well as I'll do a little Django demo. Um, but yeah, uh, so if you've ever used uh, like Google Authenticator on your phone or you've had like a little like token or whatnot, often you'll see these little six digit numbers typically. And I always thought to myself when I first got one of these a few years ago, like where is this number coming from? Like what's, what's happening? Uh, is that number secure? Is like, is, it, is like somebody else seeing that number a security problem like it is with a password? Uh, and how bad of a security problem is it? Uh, and how, how do the other kinds of factors that you see work? What are the other factors? Okay, so. Uh, I'll take you back all the way to the beginning. As, as far as I know, is the first recorded use of a password-like thing um, or a factor of authentication was pronunciation. So there's a story, and I won't do it justice, so I won't tell the whole thing, but in the Bible, um, I believe in the book of Judges, there was a story about two, uh, two cultures who were clashing. I think they had like a battle. One of them won, one of them lost. The losers were attempting to escape. And then the, the winners of the battle were not liking that and they wanted to kill them all. Uh, so yeah, whenever the losers would come up and like try to escape, you know, the, the winners would say like, okay, who are you? And they'd be like, well, you know, we're not who you think we are. Uh, and they would go, okay, so I want you to pronounce the word shibboleth. And apparently that particular culture had a very distinct accent. Um, and so they could not pronounce it in the same way as the winners did. And so if you pronounce the name wrong, they would kill you or the word wrong. Uh, so. As far as I know, this is the first recorded usage of a kind of factor of authentication, and literally there were lives at stake. Uh, and I think uh, maybe a more modern and less serious example is uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, the actor, is apparently incapable of saying the word penguins. Uh, so if you ever need to figure out if you're talking to Benedict Cumberbatch, just have him pronounce the word penguins. Uh, <laughs> He, he says, there's, like, there's some great YouTube clips of him trying to pronounce the word over and over again. And apparently, he was making a documentary and kept trying to pronounce it and just, just couldn't. And, he, and his, his staff just didn't have the heart to tell him how badly he was doing. Uh, OK, so back to factors and security, ser serious security stuff. Uh, so typically, there are three factors, um, which are something you know, something you have, and something you are. Um, and really, what all these factors are, are trying to authenticate you, that you are who you say you are, you are a user of this system, or something like that. So it is trying to get at who you are, and we try to do that by 
things you know, a thing you have with you, or a thing that you are that we can measure. Um, so things that you know are passwords. Uh, a famous example is the Swordfish password, which is actually from a 1932 Marx Brothers movie uh, is where that started. So that's why we say Swordfish all the time, or you see that as sort of like a meme over and over again about, well, what's the password? Uh, as far as I know, this is the first usage of that. Um, you can also see sometimes in like credit checks, they might ask you, uh, a credit bureau might ask you questions about like addresses you've lived at, vehicles you've owned, things like that. So they're trying to ascertain that you are who you are. Um, I've seen in some interesting examples like where they try to do age verification and try to see if you're an adult, and they might ask you like random trivia questions like that only adults could answer, like who is the vice president of the US or things like that. Um, I think that's kind of fallen out of fad now that we have Google. Um, uh, and like some, there's like a million other examples of things like secret handshakes to see if you're in a club or uh, things like any other kind of knowledge that you can use to sort of differentiate between us and them or between, or just to identify a single person. Um, so things that you have, there's a lot of examples of these. Uh, the most common example that uh, we, you probably see a lot of now are USB tokens, like these YubiKeys, YubiCo is a sponsor. Uh, and the, the sort of tokens you can carry around with you are some sort of proof that you are who you are like something you have with you, a key, or uh, some other thing that they can validate. Uh, other examples are like passports, driver's license. Uh, there used to be a lot of copy protection schemes so that you needed an actual copy of the floppy disk or the CD in order to you know, play a game or something like that because they had some physical property that you couldn't replicate. Um, I think about like PS2 or whatever games. Like you know, A lot of video games still do have this sort of thing where they try very hard to prevent you from copying them. Um, uh, you know, and also in an authentication example, cell phones with a certain number that can be used to sort of identify who you are, that if you enter this phone number in, that I will be able to respond or tell you what the text message was. That is a, something you have. You have a cell phone that is connected to a particular number. Um, other things are like uh, predetermined shared secrets. So this is like a Wi-Fi password, right? Is a, it's not really like a password, but so much as a shared password. So it's trying to, again, like exclude a group of users or find one particular one. Um, challenge coins, credit cards. There's all sorts of fun examples that we could go into. Uh, in fact, I just I spent a long time coming with this giant list and then pared it down because I was having too much fun. Um, and the things that you are is a little trickier. Uh, so typically, most of these fall under biometrics. Like, what can you measure about a person? Like, literally, biometrics means measure, you know, something biological about you. Uh, what can you measure on a human that is unique enough to where you could identify them? Things like a fingerprint are probably pretty unique. Uh, you know, face. So a lot of us have phones now for the past couple of years that have had face ID of various kinds. I think Apple has it. Android had it a little while ago. Um, retina, retina prints have been famous for this sort of thing. Uh, your signature even has been one probably that goes back you know, even further. Um, I've also seen some systems that try to determine if you are a living person, like you are physically present. This is used in, uh, I've, I've, if I recall the story correctly, it's, it was used in certain ATMs in certain countries because they had implemented hand scans and apparently the local criminals had taken to chopping off the hands of people they wanted to steal their accounts from and just taking the hand and putting it there and it worked. So they had to add a liveness detector to make sure that the person was actually attached to the hand. Um, so that's, that's a real thing that happens. Uh, and maybe a more common and less, less brutal example is like CAPTCHAs. Like CAPTCHAs are trying to determine if you're a human or not and not you know, just a, a bot or something like that. Um, so that you're capable of human reasoning. I think I also have contact in there because it was used in the movie Contact. To, like the, they were using like prime numbers or something as an example of this is an intelligent being making this, this transmission because it's using prime numbers which wouldn't occur naturally um, in a certain way. Okay, so you see the terms like MFA and 2FA used a lot. Uh, MFA is the general term for any kind of authentication that uses more than one of those factors, like something you, typically something you know and something that you have with you. And 2FA just means generally, you know, there's two of them and they almost, almost always mean that you have a password and that you're trying to add something else in addition to the password, typically a phone number or a hardware token or your Google Authenticator or, you know, Authy or Duo app or something like that, which is an algorithm called TOTP, which we'll get into uh, generally. There, there's some exceptions to this, but that's generally when people say two-factor auth, that's what they mean, even though it is a more broad term. Um, so let's first get this out of the way 
SMS and email are both very common two-factor authentication mechanisms, and there's been a lot of stuff in the news about how terrible they are, and they are terrible. Uh, in general, you shouldn't use them and if you have a better option, but they are better than nothing. Uh, for those of you who may not know, if you, you can add like SMS or you know, something like that to your bank account or any other like, site you log into, and it will generally text you and then you know, say, enter a code that we texted you to prove that you have access to that email address or that, or that SMS uh, number. Um, these, uh, the problem is, is that SMS and email are both very easily compromised, and they're not transmitted securely at all. They're based on very legacy protocols, uh, so it's possible to intercept them, and they're also a lot easier to hijack and whatnot. There have definitely been cases uh, of people having their accounts stolen, uh, or their email stolen, or their SMS number redirected, um, and things like that. Uh, but certainly, if you don't have any other options, they're better than nothing. Uh, but really, we can do better. Uh, so the, the, better, the better thing, the, the easy thing that almost anyone can do, because almost all of us have smartphones at this point, is use an app. Uh, Google Authenticator is sort of the classic example of an app. Uh, there's a lot of other ones that use this since it's an open protocol, that generally are open protocols. Our Authy is one made by Twilio, even the company I work for, uh, although I won't talk about Authy in detail, really. Uh, Duo is another one. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, apps out there that implement these protocols. Um, and you know, for all major platforms, uh, and the open protocols are generally called HOTP and TOTP that they implement. And so let's talk about that. Um, so HOTP is sort of the core algorithm that all these are using to generate these six-digit codes that you see. Um, and it stands for HMAC-based one-time password. So it's a one-time password, meaning you're going to get to use it exactly once. And it's HMAC, uh, meaning HMAC stands for hash-based message authentication code. Uh, so it's a way to authenticate you using hashing algorithms like SHA-1, SHA-2, MD5, I guess. Um, please don't use MD5. Uh, uh, and in general, actually, SHA-1, I can talk a little bit about too, is generally something you should avoid, but in this case, it's fine. Uh, as far as I know, uh, SHA-1 in this use case is not uh, com been compromised in any way. So um, it's, it's generally fine. Um, the algorithm is really simple. Um, that computes a, uh, sorry for the math notation, but uh, that computes um, essentially the digits that you see from, from your sort of shared secret. So the core to any TOTP or HOTP is that you have some sort of shared secret. Like they transmitted to you at some point, uh, usually via QR code, which I can show an example of, like a little like uh, basically hex string or a base32 string that is just random numbers. And you are trying to prove that you are in possession of that secret. Uh, to them. And the way you do that is by hashing it uh, in a clever way. So in this algorithm here, I don't really need to go into details, but essentially you hash it along with whatever message, uh, and I'll get into exactly what that looks like, and then you take that and you sort of hash it again. So it's, it's a sort of double hashing, but in different ways uh, that's relatively secure. And then you compute, and you take that hash value and you convert it into numbers. Um, uh, so this is a Python conference, so I'll show you in Python how it works. Maybe this will make a little bit more sense. Um, so the first, the first lines there are just a cute way to do XOR in Python. Um, if you actually just pre-compute all the values, you can then, I don't have my laser pointer on me, sadly, but you can then just do translate to sort of translate between bytes. Uh, I guess this is probably Python 2, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just essentially just doing that, just hash, XOR, and then do another concatenate and hash. Like, Pretty straightforward, um, nothing really complicated or too mathy going on here. Uh, the way to convert that to a six-digit number is maybe slightly more complicated um, in that you just basically take the last hex digit as an offset into the rest of the hex digits, and then you sort of take 31 bits of that and then take that modulo the number of digits that you want. So if you want, you just take the bottom six digits of that. Um, so. Nothing, nothing really complicated, like nothing, nothing hidden, nothing magical about what's going on. And, you know, very straightforward. And so I talked about HOTP. So HOTP is where you just do this with some shared secret and a counter. Sorry, I didn't specify that. A counter that starts at zero that's eight bytes. And so every time you would use it, it increments the counter by one. So every time you pull a code from your phone, it would increment that by one, and the server would have to know that. There's obviously some problems because you can get out of sync if you, like, accidentally hit the button a couple times. Or if the server you know, thinks if someone else tried to authenticate as you, it can like, increment the counter. And so you get these counter drifting things. Um, and plus, it's just kind of annoying to keep track of this extra bit of state. 
And so TOTP is the same thing, except for you don't have a counter. Instead, you just take the current time, rounded to the nearest 30 seconds. So this is just Unix time. Um, you can theoretically shift it around if you need to, uh, but almost everyone universally just does Unix time divided by 30 and, to, and just throws away the remainder, and that's the current counter. Um, so this is why in your Google Authenticator app, if you ever see it, it rolls over every 30 seconds. It is doing exactly this algorithm. So it's doing the HOTP algorithm that we just saw where the, the message is just this counter that uh, is based on time. Uh, technically, all of these are customizable. So uh, in general, you see 30. In general, you see six digits. Um, but you can theoretically do you know, an arbitrary hashing algorithm, an arbitrary amount of time, um, you know, and pretty much any, anything you want to redefine, you can. But everybody uses the defaults of six digits, 30 seconds. Um, so, so how secure are these? So I went through this, and that was one of the questions I had to myself you know, initially was, how secure are these six-digit numbers? Like, I mean, really, is a six-digit number going to be that much better than just my password? And it turns out, yes. Uh, so these are reasonably secure. So it's, a 30, it's, it's not just the fact that it's a six-digit password. It's a six-digit password that changes every 30 seconds. So it's not like something that someone can just try to guess. Like, they only have 30 seconds. They can usually only try once. Um, and then they just have to wait another 30 seconds, and they get a new one. Um, also, in general, six digits is roughly 2 to the 20, uh, 2 to the 20th power. And that's roughly amount, the same number of choices or the same amount of entropy in a typical password that's chosen. It's like the equivalent of a pretty standard average user's password. So you know, it's not actually significantly worse than that. Like, they'd pr they have about the same chance of guessing your password randomly if they get one choice as they do of guessing a random six-digit number. Um, so that's not so bad. Uh, but the most important part is those six digits don't actually reveal anything. Like, I could sit here with my phone and show you all, six, you know, all of my, my code, six-digit codes for the next hour, and that gives you really zero information about the underlying thing. The way that it does the sort of double hashing algorithm with the XORs is just clever enough to where it makes anything but a brute force attack impossible. Uh, there's, not, there's not any clever shortcuts. Compromi the compromises that we've seen in things like SHA-1 um, don't really lend themselves well to an attack. So you would have to still break all of SHA-1, like the full 160-bit uh, hash in order to, to get anything. And the six digits don't help you in that at all. Like they just, they give you a way to check, but they don't, they don't give you a way to roll that back and get the key from it uh, or get the shared secret. Um, this, however, is not true of MD5. I think uh, MD5 is sufficiently broken that, the, that there is a compromise in security with HMAC with MD5. Um, but oh, I think, luckily, universally, people use SHA-1. SHA-2, 256 is also used. Uh, but I think SHA-1 is what everyone uses in general. Um, and again, so how do you transmit these? You've probably seen these if you've ever had a two-factor auth uh, session. You get a little QR code. You scan it with your app. And then that transmits it. Well, what's, what's in the QR code? It's just this URL here, the uh, OTP auth URL, um, which contains a base32 secret, the algorithm, the number of digits, and the period. Um, I think those are the defaults. So you don't technically need those in most of it. You really just need the secret and like a username uh, so that it can identify it on your phone. Um, and that's an actual one generated by my app that, uh, that I demo here. Um, and how does a QR code work? Because I'm always curious, like, OK, well, what's the next level? How does, how does a QR code transmit that information? And that's a whole other talk. Uh, like, I, I, th I thought I could come up with a nice, succinct uh, description of how QR codes work. But they're actually incredibly complicated and interesting. And I would love to talk to you about those at another talk. Um, and in general, if you want to see the, the URI format, it's, it's not a standard. Like the other ones were RFCs. These, this is sort of just a de facto standard because it's what Google does. And everybody's just copied it. Um, so you can see that on Google's GitHub. OK, so that's sort of like the summary of HOTP and TOTP, the sort of mathy, the mathiest pieces of this. Um, and that's sort of the most common thing I think most people do now. Uh, the next step would be to get a hardware token. Um, so like a YubiKey, or there's things like UT UTF-0, and I'll talk about what UTF is, U2F uh, zeros, and other, other sorts of little hardware tokens you can get. Um, and also, you might have heard words like trusted platform module or secure element if you've gotten into hardware much. Um, TPM is essentially, to a first approximation, it's like having a YubiKey or a hardware token embedded inside your computer. Um, they've been present in almost every laptop for, and every desktop for the past decade or so. But they're not used super much. 
Um, but all it is, uh, all these things are, are generally a secure element, which means a chip that has very limited functionality, like it can generate keys, it can generate random numbers, and it can sign things. But it can't really compute things, and there's no way to get the information back out of it. You can only use the information, not actually get at it. Um, and then it's a standard set of protocols for getting at it. I won't go into any more detail on that. Uh, TPM is a set of standards for how to do all this stuff. And it's very interesting, but again, it's not super useful for us in our everyday lives, I think, um, whereas Google Authenticator and stuff are. Um, okay, so let's talk about Django piece of this now. So uh, I talked, you know, uh, about this, like, how do, we, how do we go ahead and add this into our authentication? You know, like, Django has all these built-in admin uh, tools and uh, username and password verification and stuff like that. Like, how can we do that? Um, so in general, you can just do this. You can install Django OTP. Uh, you can install QR code. And that will give you kind of a rough... Uh, first approximation of what you can do, um, and I'll go into how you hook it in. But you can, you can basically add in this into your login flow into your existing system. Um, it's a bit rough around the edges. The flow can be very awkward. You're gonna have to engineer a lot of your own login flow to really work well with it. It doesn't really do resets very well. Um, it, it's not super secure in its implementation, but it's certainly, it's a good first start. Like, and you know, maybe we can sprint on it or something to improve it, but there's definitely a lot of room for improvement, but I think it assumes that you've probably customized your login flow so much that you, you know, are probably gonna have to customize it with this anyway. Um, I think I have a, like, just like a little brief tutorial on how to integrate it here. It really is a matter of, if, if you're familiar with Django, uh, you have to just add it into your installed apps. Uh, you, you have to create uh, your own admin view, essentially. Uh, uh, slap that into your installed apps, add in the OTP middleware, um, this is what the, the, the little, like, it, it's very, the, the site you need to add into there is very simple. It basically just needs to inherit from the normal admin site. Um, you need to create, like, a simple, like, sample app config um, in your apps.py, and then you can, in your views, use, and there's the, normally the is authenticated, which tells you that the user is logged in, but it adds a new one, which is, is verified, uh, which is a function that you have to call, but that will tell you if they've uh, been two-factor opt in. Um, as opposed to just use their password. Um, so I can demo that really briefly. I know, let's, 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 let's live life dangerously and delete my database uh, before I do this. So this will be like a real demo. Um, so Python manage, so the first thing I said we have to do, you have to migrate to get all the junk in your database. Uh, you have to then you know, do the Django things where you create a super user, um, create super user, Swenson is good. Uh, whatever, there's my email address, Swenson at Swenson.io. Password is Swenson. It's gonna yell at me and I don't care. Um, okay, so demo, settings. Oh, well, so if we just try to start it up now, I think I have it already set up here. Settings.py. Uh, so yeah, you can see that I've got my OTP admin in there. If I try to Python manage, run server. I'm running low on time, so just, I'm trying to run through this. Uh, run server, localhost. So it's gonna direct me here, but I haven't set up an OTP yet. And so this is why, this is where one of the awkward things is, is by default, it assumes that you have an OTP and it requires you have it, but I haven't added that to my account yet. And so it's a little awkward, but you have to kind of go in and disable it. Um, so disable it and then add your OTP auth and then re-enable it. Uh, and it's sort of like, that's only the bootstrap process. Um, it's a little, yeah, so then you can go in Swenson, Swenson. It gets you like this little TOTP thing. You can sort of add a TOTP device, you know, Swenson, search, I think user one. Um, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's like, oh, here's the secret, you know, like all these things that you shouldn't really have access to. Uh, <laughs> this field is required, whatever. Uh, yeah, again, sort of all these things that you shouldn't, shouldn't really have. Uh, access to, and you can view a QR code for it as well if you have the QR code modules. And again, like the admin really, like these should be generated once and you should never see them again. So this is just like a little awkward. Uh, the danger there is that uh, they, can, uh, they can impersonate you, um, theoretically. So, all right, so the, I'll quickly go over the problems um, and talk about U2F really fast. So 
what are the problems with MFA? Yeah, you can lose your device and you're just out of luck. Like sometimes there's no recourse for losing your device or losing your hardware token. You may not be able to reset your password. You may be able to, you may have like had like a recovery code printed out and maybe you lost that. Like there's a lot of problems with two-factor auth in that it assumes that you can never lose it. Um, the recovery methods are not great because otherwise the attacker would just use a recovery method to steal your account, right? Um, you just have to hope that you can convince support that you can reset your account but that an attacker couldn't. And hope is not a great security um, uh, tool. Uh, it's also kind of annoying to type in things for the uh, into the devices. Um, Bluetooth support on these is kind of iffy, and it only tends to work with like one account. Uh, the hardware is a little tricky. Uh, like sometimes, like the UB keys and things like that have a very limited set of keys that they can handle. Um, they can't have like necessarily a lot of keys. Some of them are addressing this. Um, but that can kind of limit their utility. Um, and also, like I said, the TOTP and HOTP ones are symmetric. So the admin, any admin who has access to the secret can then create a copy of it and then can impersonate you, which is never great in a security system. Um, so there's sort of a, a new standard called U2F, uh, Universal Second Factor. It was made by Ubico and Google. Um, I think some other ones have joined the consortium now, which is basically a standard for hardware devices that's trying to address this. Uh, that tries to address these problems. It uses asymmetric cryptography so that you can create the key once and then the admin never sees it and can never impersonate you. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not super well supported outside of the largest websites. Um, so it's, limit, it's limited in utility and Django support is almost non-existent so far. Um, I think there's another talk later this afternoon that will prove me wrong on that, I hope, on some sort of newer way to do authentication that does work well with Django. So I look forward to, to being wrong. Um, but as far as I could tell when I did my research for this, there wasn't a lot. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's about it. I think I have a few minutes for questions. Um, I kind of hurried through the end there, and I'm happy to go through them. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing questions exactly. Uh, we have four minutes for questions. So yeah, uh, like find a, are there microphones, or do they come to the, there's a microphone. So Just a reminder, can, the question time is for questions, not sharing information, and raise your hands. Yeah, you can share information with me afterwards, uh, but yeah, questions, are, questions should be questions. Great. Why is the hardware token better? Um, what, why is what? I'm sorry? What was the, the question? Token. I'm sorry. The I, hard, hardware token. Oh, hardware token. What about them? Oh, why is it better? It's just because they're typically, uh, so they use secure elements, which are typically chips that are, you can't get information out of. Uh, so meaning even if you stole the token, like if you had a minute at the airport and you stole it and you, know, you tried to James Bond the token, the, like the information out of it, you just can't. There's no way to get that information out. So it's sort of like this impenetrable fortress you're carrying around with you. Uh, so like an unclonable device uh, is uh, other words I've seen for that. So basically it's something you can carry with you that can't be cloned. Uh, that only you have and there can't be any copies of it. So it's just something that only you should have. Uh, someone can, of course, physically steal it from you. Uh, but hopefully you have recovery codes or something. Uh, another question. Let's see, a couple. Uh, I've seen a recent trend recently of um, instead of typing in your six-digit number, quite often you'll just get like a notification on your phone and you just hit approve. Does that use the same protocols at all, or is that something totally different? Uh, so some of them use very similar protocols. Uh, if There's no reason to truncate it to six digits. If you're going to have a computer do it, they will just typically give you like the full hash value uh, because they can transmit the whole thing, and that's going to be a little bit more secure. So, But they're based on generally very similar algorithms, like uh, using HMAX to sort of validate that you have access to that key or whatnot. It's also like how AWS validates requests uh, from your account, you actually use your access code and your secret code as a, an HMAC key, right? Um, and you see that if you ever see like the AWS signing algorithm. Uh, but they, they use HMACs for that as well. It's a great way to take like a secret key and prove that you have that secret key without revealing what it is. And I think a lot of the push notification uh, services use similar technology to that. Um, it would, some of those details are proprietary, so I'm not sure. I think and then you. Hi there, my name is Philip. I thought this was a really great talk. Uh, you mentioned that there is a problem with bootstrapping where you were able to kind of make a quick change to disable it uh, and then re-enable it. Oh, yeah. That works uh, well for localhost. That's yes. probably not what you want to be doing on prod. Yes. So what, uh, what, what does a 
reasonable bootstrapping process look like for that? Uh, so if you're doing this in production, presumably you probably have a custom login form that you've developed already uh, and that you would probably know how to hook into this. And you just wouldn't, so I think I showed this little bit here, like you wouldn't start adding in the user is verified into it until you had a flow to add two-factor auth to people's accounts and to have them do resets and things like that. So you'd want to develop all of that in your normal flow. And like that would be a little too complicated for a small demo. Um, but presumably you know or someone knows how your authentication works, hopefully, and the, maybe not. Uh, and if not, good luck. Um, uh, but generally, something along this line where you're basically adding the is verified, and uh, yeah, you sort of work it into your flow a little bit better. Um, but it, the, the plugin by default doesn't have a great story there. All right, thank you. We are unfortunately out of time.